We've arrived at the heart of the Proton NMR demonstration lesson. We're on step number seven of our 1D acquisition and processing instructions list. This step will take us two videos to explain. In addition to a copy of the instructions, I recommend having a copy of the basic experimental parameters nearby, which you can find on our website under the main menu link for training. Now we'll jump on in by clicking the acquisition parameters button the first parameter on the menu is the pulse program. This is a set of instructions telling the spectrometer when to wait, when to pulse, and when to acquire. The standard worker file, named ZG, contains the spectrometer's instructions for the basic pulse acquire NMR experiment. You should definitely watch the five minute YouTube video by Lars Hansen. It's called Simple Demonstration of Magnetic Resonance as Used in the NMR and MRI in order to understand how pulse acquire works. The parameter in the table TD is the number of points used to digitize the FID. It is simply a number. It does not have any physical units. The next parameter is NS. This determines how many times the pulse acquire experiment will loop, or in other words, how many FIDs will be signal averaged to increase the signal to noise ratio. DS stands for dummy shots, which is how many times we want to run the entire pulse acquire experiment without saving the FID. The spectral width in Hertz is given by SWH. If I want to know the spectral width in PPM, I can type SW at the command line and it will do the calculation for me. When I set the spectral width, I automatically set the digitization rate. Since DW, the time between each of the TV points when digitizing the FID, or the sampling rate, or the dwell time, is equal to 1 over twice the spectral width in hertz. You can try it yourself. The inverse of our spectral width is 1 divided by 4,000. And that gives us 0 0.000250, or 250 microseconds. Half of that is 125 microseconds, which is our dwell. This ensures that the Nyquist condition for digitization is met. The next parameter is the acquisition time. This is the time that the detector is on, or the time during which the FID is being recorded. How long is that? It's the number of times the signal intensity is recorded, multiplied by the time interval between each point. So AQ, our acquisition time, is equal to TD, the number of points used to digitize the FID, multiplied by the dwell time, which is determined by one over twice the specified spectral width. The receiver gain is how much to amplify the signal before digitizing it. The spectrometer will automatically determine the optimal receiver gain experimentally with the command RGA. We'll right click on the acquisition information window and we'll choose start RGA. This is step number 7B of our instructions list. How long it takes the computer to determine the best RG value depends on the parameters AQ and D1. The bigger those values, the longer the RG routine will take. We can see what the automation routine is doing by looking at the blue lettered status report at the bottom of the screen. Once the program converges on an optimal amplification value, which depends on the intensity of the strongest signal in the sample, it will say RGA finished and a new value for RG will automatically appear in the table. Next on our list is DW, our dwell time which is set by 1 over twice the spectral width in hertz. Right now, it's 124.8 microseconds. That's the time interval between each of the 16,000 data points, which gives us a total acquisition time of 2 seconds in order to record the FID. The dead time, DE, is usually 6 or 6.5 six microseconds. The same coil is used for the transmitter and the receiver. After the RF pulse is turned off, there's a spike called ring down in the self-resonating circuit. We don't want to digitize the spike, so we'll throw out the first six or six and a half microseconds before we begin digitizing the signal every 125 microseconds or so. The spectrometer can either pulse or not pulse. The pulse program we've requested tells the timing unit of the spectrometer to wait D1 seconds before the RF pulse in our pulse acquire experiment. D1 is the first delay. In this experiment, it is the only delay. 
the difference between all the NMR experiments is in the placement, numbers, and durations of the pulses and delays. In the margin here, it is written that we should set D1 from 1 to 5 times T1. What is T1? It's the relaxation time constant that explains the return of the nuclear spins to thermal equilibrium in the absence of an RF pulse. T1 is not a parameter we can change by altering any of the values in this table. The nuclei behave like frictionless gyroscopes at the center of the atoms, yet the turbulent molecular environment causes slight but ever-changing fluctuations of the local direction and magnitude of the magnetic fields surrounding the nuclei. These continual magnetic wanderings toward a steady state orientation bias for the lower magnetic energy depend on the time scales of the molecular motions of the surroundings with respect to the frequency of the transiently applied energy from the RF pulse. Each different proton in our proton NMR spectrum will have its own T1 value. T1 is also called the spin lattice relaxation time constant or the longitudinal relaxation times constant, which are all synonyms. In short, I don't know the T1 of this sample of this field without measuring it. For quantitative measurements, it is important to measure the longest T1 value of the signals of interest and to set AQ plus D1 greater than or equal to five times T1. On the other hand, if you would like to suppress a peak using RF saturation, you should be pulsing faster than about one half of T1. For standard or survey proton NMR, a typical range of values are between zero to three seconds when the FID is not being truncated. So this default value of 2.5 seconds is fine for now. TD0 is another loop that contains the NS loop inside it. Every NS, the acquired data will be transferred from the CCU in the cabinet to this computer where I'm sitting. If something happens to the computer connections before the data is transferred, it'll be lost. So if I'm running a very long experiment, I might want to transfer the data every so often. And I can do this using TD0. Another strategy is to collect blocks of data in different experiment numbers using a command called multi-ZG. If you use multi-ZG, then at the end you'll need to add all the different experiments together. The last parameters in the list are for the RF pulse. With the ZG pulse program, the shape is automatically set for a square pulse. P1 gives the duration of the pulse in microseconds. Here it is 11 microseconds. PL1 gives the power level of the pulse in terms of the attenuation, the reduction of the maximum power output. Here PL1 is minus six decibels, which means that we'll be applying the maximum output power a bit over 100 watts. The relative phase of the electromagnetic wave relative to a reference wave is defined in the pulse sequence itself with the parameters pH1 and pH31 for the transmitter and receiver phases respectively. Step number 7C is to start the acquisition of an FID using the default parameters for a single shot, which I'll do by clicking on this play button. Step number 7D where we tailor the acquisition parameters to this particular sample based on the outcome of the scout shot will be covered in the next video.